It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Amara Dunn, who is a biological control specialist with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And Amara is going to talk today about um, whether or not there is a place for biological fungicides on your farm. And as a reminder, um, all of these webinars are being funded by um, the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Program and the US Department of Agriculture National Institute of uh, Food and Agriculture. As Crystal mentioned, I am with the Integrated Pest Management Program, which is a part of Cornell Cooperative Extension. And I'm very happy to be joining you all today. I appreciate the invitation from Crystal and Ethan. And I also appreciate the language justice team who are helping us with translation and interpretation today. So today we're going to be talking about three things. First, we'll talk about what are biological fungicides. Then we'll talk about how do biological fungicides work. And then we'll finish by talking a little about how to use biological fungicides effectively. Uh, and at the bottom of the slide, there's just a note that Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal program and employment opportunities. As Crystal mentioned, I love getting uh, questions or comments in the chat. And I am hopefully going to be able to keep an eye on the chat. Feel free to use whichever language you feel most comfortable in. And as Crystal mentioned, the language justice team can translate or interpret that. I also wanted to add a note, a reminder, I will be talking about pesticides today. And so just a reminder to please read and follow all pesticide labels. So let's get started with what are biological fungicides. Biological fungicides are often called biofungicides, just as a way to shorten the name. So throughout the rest of this talk, I'll probably refer to them as biofungicides. I wanted to let everyone know that. Biofungicide just means a fungicide that comes from a natural material or something that's living. And biofungicides are made from either plants or microorganisms, which could be bacteria, fungi, viruses, or they could be minerals or some other natural compounds. And so these are the active ingredients that would be in a biofungicide. The Environmental Protection Agency uh, defines what active ingredient is considered a biofungicide or not. If the active ingredient is a plant or microorganism, then it's a biofungicide. With the minerals and the natural compounds, you can't always tell just by looking at the name. Some of them are considered biofungicides and some of them might not be. Biofungicides control plant diseases. And even though they're called biofungicides, they can control either diseases caused by fungi, like the picture on the left of powdery mildew on pumpkins, or they can control diseases caused by bacteria, like the picture on the right, which is black rot on cabbage. Very importantly, biofungicides are still pesticides, even though they are biological. And because they are pesticides, they have labels. So for example, the label would include um, a signal word, like this one that says caution. And it will have other notes on it, like keep out of reach of children. The label will have additional precautionary statements on subsequent pages. The label will also have an EPA registration number, an Environmental Protection Agency registration number. And this particular label specifies the quantity in the um, jug. 
The one exception to this is there are some active ingredients that are, for example, from plants like rosemary oil or thyme oil that the Environmental Protection Agency considers to be minimum risk. And so this special list of active ingredients, if the uh, pesticide contains only these active ingredients, it is considered minimum risk and it is exempt from registration as of right now. Um, those laws may be changing in the future, um, but so those products will not have a regular pesticide label. The label that it does have on it, not a pesticide label, but just a label on the container may actually specify this product is exempt from registration. Because biofungicides are pesticides, all of the other things that apply to pesticides also apply to biofungicides. So they may have on their label a restricted entry interval that designates how long you have to wait between when the biofungicide was applied and when a person can enter the space where it was applied. And they may also designate a pre-harvest interval, how long you have to wait before applying the product and when you can harvest produce from the product, from that field or space. And biofungicides require personal protective equipment. Um, so that might be gloves or eye protection or respiratory protection or some other clothing. And in particular, biofungicides whose active ingredient is a microorganism, a microbe, a bacterium, or a fungus, those usually have some requirement for respiratory breathing protection because those microbes can cause allergic reactions in some people. Uh, and so there is usually that precaution on the label. Biofungicides may be, but are not necessarily allowed in organic production. So this is the logo for the Organic um, Materials Review Institute. Um, and this is one organization of several that review pesticides and other um, products used in agricultural production and determine whether they're permitted on a certified organic farm. Uh, a lot of biofungicides are approved for use in organic production, but some of them are not. So it's very important that you read the label and talk with your certifier if you have questions. Very importantly, biofungicides are different from biostimulants. So biostimulants may be made of the same things. They may be made of plants or of seaweed extract or of microorganisms or minerals or other naturally occurring substances. However, they have a different purpose. The purpose of a biostimulant is to grow a healthier plant or to cause the plant to uh, be higher quality or produce better quality fruits or vegetables. A biostimulant is not for the purpose of controlling pests. So that's the big distinction between biofungicides and biostimulants. So now that we've talked a little bit about what a biofungicide is, I thought we could practice. I will show you some information about different products and you can decide if it is a biofungicide or not a biofungicide. You can put your answer in the chat in whatever language um, you feel most comfortable with. Um, and I can probably um, determine if you're just typing biofungicide or not a biofungicide, I can probably uh, determine which your answer is um, without translation. So this is our first product. It's something called Serenade Opti. Um, you can see that it does have, it is listed by OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute. The active ingredient is a bacterium called Bacillus subtilis, particular strain of that bacterium. And the label specifies that it is for the control or suppression of many important plant diseases. It also has an EPA registration number. So if you could take a moment and put in the chat if you think this is a biopesticide or not a biopesticide. seeing some answers come in and I appreciate those answers.
there seems to be consensus that this is a biofungicide. And you are correct. It is a biofungicide because its purpose is to control plant diseases. It has a microbe as an active ingredient and it has an EPA registration number. The next product is called BioActivate. And the description on the website says that it is made from seaweed extract and that it provides nutrients and natural plant hormones with the goal of promoting root and shoot growth of plants. It has no EPA registration number. Does this sound like it is a biofungicide or not a biofungicide? I'm seeing consensus in the chat that this is not a biofungicide, and you are all correct, because it is not for the purpose of controlling plant diseases. It is for the purpose of growing a healthier plant, and it has no EPA registration number. And then this product is called Root Shield Plus WP. It says that it's a biological fungicide. The active ingredient are two different species of a fungus called trichoderma, and it has an EPA registration number. Does this look like a biofungicide or not a biofungicide? Great, thank you for your participation. I agree, this is a biofungicide. Uh, it actually says biological fungicide on it, but you can also tell because it has an EPA registration number. Does anyone have any questions at this point in the talk? And you can either type your questions into the chat in whichever language you are most comfortable with, or if you would like to unmute and ask your question, again, in whichever language you are most comfortable with, um, interpreters can interpret um, if you are asking in Spanish. So I'll pause for a moment if anyone has questions. see a question in the chat asking to expand a little bit more on bioactivate. Um, are you, what type of additional information are you looking for? What the product is or what type of crops? Um, I don't know what type of crops it is being promoted for. Um, I didn't read the rest of the product label to find that out. I will say that one of the challenges with biostimulants is that they are not currently registered or regulated in any way, the way that a biofungicide would be. Uh, and that means that it is sometimes hard to determine if the claims that are made by the product are actually going to give you the results that they hope that it will. Um, the products aren't are tested or regulated in the same way that biofungicides would be. Okay, let's move on to talking about how biofungicides work. So for this portion of the talk, I am going to ask for your um, participation again. So I will show you a series of pictures that are my attempts to describe or illustrate how biofungicides work, what their mode of action is. Uh, but before I show you those pictures, I wanted to let you know some of the, uh, what the different symbols mean in the pictures. So I'm going to be using the color blue to represent things that are associated with biofungicides. Those could be living microorganisms that might be producing something. So I have these little droplets coming out from this happy bacterium, or they could be spores. So maybe a fungal spore of a beneficial fungus that can grow, 
or they could be something that's not alive, and that's represented by these blue diamonds. I will also have some yellow rectangles that are representing plant pathogens. Some of them look angry and some of them will have frightened faces on them. So here's our first picture. Um, on this leaf, we have some happy beneficial microbes that are producing some compounds and some plant pathogens that are looking frightened. And so these are the five possible modes of action that I'm trying to depict with this picture. Um, and in a moment, I'll ask you to decide which mode of action you think best describes this picture. So the options are eat, where a living microorganism will grow on the plant pathogen and eat it and kill it that way, or keep out, where a living microbe will cover the plant and leave no space for a pathogen to grow, or turn on resistance, where the plant's defenses against the pathogen are turned on or activated. The fourth option is poison. So the biofungicide contains or it produces some compound that harms the plant pathogen. And finally, building stronger plants. So the biofungicide makes the plant stronger and healthier and more resilient when the plant is attacked by a pathogen. So which of these five modes of action do you think best fits the picture here? And you can put your response into the chat. Okay, I'm seeing a few different responses in the chat. Um, and I will say, I feel like there isn't really wrong answers to these pictures, because again, these are my attempts to represent something with a picture. Um, so I could see how this looks like it's keeping the pathogen out, the microbes are on the leaf, the pathogen doesn't have space. Um, I think it also could represent poisoning. So the microbes in the biofungicide are producing something that is hurting the plant pathogens. That was what I was attempting to show, but again, this may be as much about my ability to illustrate modes of action as anything else. In this situation, the biofungicide might contain a compound or it might contain living microbes that produce a compound that will kill plant pathogens. Uh, and so with this mode of action, what's in the biofungicide, the active ingredient could be alive or it could be not alive. Some examples with this mode of action are double nickel, which contains a bacterium called Bacillus amyloliquefaciens. And this is a biofungicide where the compounds that are poisoning the pathogen are already in the jug when you buy it. So there's very little production of additional poisoning compounds after you apply the biofungicide. They're all in the jug already. Another example is uh, biofungicides that contain potassium bicarbonate. Millstop is one example, but there are others. The potassium bicarbonate is considered a natural compound and it's considered a, a biofungicide by the Environmental Protection Agency, and it also functions in this way. All right, here's our next picture. We have a plant pathogen that is getting some spores on it from a biofungicide. And those spores grow and the plant pathogen dies. So we have the same options for modes of action. Does this look like a live microbe that is eating the pathogen and killing it? Does it look like the microbe is covering the plant and leaving no space for the pathogen? Does it look like resistance of the plant is being turned on? We already talked about poison. And, or does it look like the we're building a stronger plant? 
you can go ahead and put your choice in the chat. I see a lot of votes for eating, which is what I was trying to depict. Uh, so with this mode of action, the microbe that is in the biofungicide has to be alive. It has to be alive in the package. It has to be alive after it contacts the pathogen because it has to grow on and eat the pathogen. Um, an example of this in terms of controlling plant diseases is a biofungicide called Contans. And it contains the fungus Paraconiotherium minitans, which will grow on and degrade um, the pathogen that causes white mold. Here is our next picture. We have some leaves that are covered by happy blue microbes that are in biofungicides. And then there are some angry pathogens that are not on the leaves because the leaves are covered with the biofungicide. And so again, I will ask you to choose, does this look like eating? Does it look like the live microbe is leaving no space for the pathogen, keeping it out? Does it look like the resistance of the plant has been turned on? The pathogen is being poisoned or the plant is being made stronger? You can go ahead and put your response in the chat if you have not already. I agree with the group. Uh, this was my attempt to illustrate keeping out. And so in this situation, the microbe grows on the plant. The pathogen can't cause disease if it can't land on the plant and start the infection. Um, and it's very important with this mode of action that the microbe is alive. And the reason I'm noting this is the microbe alive, not alive. Um, if the microbe needs to be alive to work in a biofungicide, then it's very important that you take some steps to keep it alive, for example, during storage and application. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Two examples of biofungicides that work in this way are actinovate, which contains the bacterium Streptomyces lydicus, and Seraphel, which contains a different bacterium, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens. I will mention also that a lot of biofungicides have multiple modes of action. So, it is entirely possible that the biofungicide might both keep out a pathogen and also poison the pathogen. Here's our next picture. We have a plant that has these happy blue microbes on the roots and on the leaves, and there are little lightning bolts coming out all around the plant. So again, does this look like the biofungicide is eating the pathogen? Is it keeping the pathogen out? Is it turning on the plant's defenses? Is it poisoning the pathogen? Or is it building a stronger plant? And you can go ahead and put your choice in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of votes for turning on plant resistance, which was what I was attempting to depict in this picture. So plants have defense systems. They have ways that they defend themselves from pathogens. And that's actually why 
most pathogens don't cause disease on most plants. A pathogen only causes disease on certain plants. And so some biofungicides work by pre-activating those plant defenses so that when the pathogen does show up, the plant is ready to defend itself. Because of this mode of action, it's very important that the biofungicide be applied before the plant encounters a pathogen because it needs time to activate those defenses. However, the biofungicide could be something that is alive, like a microorganism, or it could be something that's not alive anymore. So two examples are the biofungicide LifeGuard, which contains the bacterium Bacillus mycoides, or Regalia, which contains a plant extract from the giant knotweed plant. And here's our last example of a mode of action of a biofungicide. So we have one plant that is smaller and one plant that is larger. The plant that is larger has some happy blue microbes on the roots and on the leaves. And again, uh, you can decide, does this look like the biofungicide is eating the, path the pathogen, keeping the pathogen out, turning on plant, plant resistance, poisoning the pathogen, or building a stronger plant. See some responses coming in the chat. And I would agree with all of you, this was my attempt to visualize building stronger plants. So healthier plants are more resilient against attack from plant pathogens that cause disease, just like healthier people are more resilient against disease. Uh, some examples of biofungicides that work in this way are root shield, and you saw a label for root shield earlier. It has contains um, the fungus trichoderma. This is one of the modes of action of root shield, but it has other modes of action as well. This is also a mode of action for the biofungicide serenade, which contains Bacillus subtilis. And the active ingredient in this type of biofungicide could be alive or it could be not alive. Again, this is a situation where because the biofungicide works by helping the plant be stronger and healthier, it's very important that you apply it well in advance of when the pathogen is attacking the plant. If the pathogen has already attacked the plant, this mode of action is not going to work. The other note I wanna make about this mode of action is that uh, you might think, well, this sounds a lot like how a biostimulant works. Biostimulants make healthier plants too. And you are correct. The important distinction is that a biofungicide that works in this way is for the purpose of controlling disease and biostimulant is just for the purpose of growing a healthier plant. And in order for a biofungicide to make that claim that it controls disease by growing a healthier plant, it has to go through a process with the Environmental Protection Agency um, to provide some evidence that that is happening. So it's a very important distinction between biofungicides that work by making plants stronger and biostimulants that grow healthier plants, but not for the purpose of disease control. So there's a question in the chat. Can root shield be used by adding it to soil mix in addition to using it as a spray or a drench? You would have to double check the label, but I do believe that at least some of the root shield formulations can be used by mixing them into soil. There are a few different formulations. Um, there's root shield and root shield plus, and some of them come as a wettable powder, and some of them come as granules. So double check the label, but I believe there is um, at least one root shield product that can be used in that way. Amara, one quick question about that. Um, if you're mixing a powder like root shield into your mix, do you then have to use PPE every time you use your mix until it's wetted? That is an excellent question, Crystal. I don't off the top of my head know the answer, but I would start by reading the label to see what it says um, and definitely following 
the instructions on the label. Um, it seems like wearing some respiratory protection until the soil mix is wetted would certainly be an extra precaution to take. So the label describes the minimum protection you need. Um, but if you wanted to uh, use some additional protection until you've gotten that soil mix wet, then that would certainly be um, something that you could do. And I'm hopeful the label would have some instructions about that. I will also say um, that often the manufacturers of biofungicides um, can be a good source for information about the product. And if you have questions on the label, you can ask them. Um, you can also ask your local extension agent. Uh, and Cornell also has a group called the Pesticide Safety Education Program. And they are also there to answer questions about using pesticides safely. Do biofungicides have half lives or do they dissipate down to negligible amounts over time and exposure to the elements? I think the short answer is um, yes. Uh, and it kind of depends on what the biofungicide is and how it's supposed to work. So if it is a living organism, a microbe, microbes don't live forever, nothing lives forever. Um, and so at some point, those microbes are dead and they're not doing what they were supposed to do anymore. And like any compound, like conventional chemical pesticides as well, biofungicides would also get naturally degraded in the environment. What are the potential effects of biofungicides on mycorrhizae? So mycorrhizae would be a type of beneficial fungus that um, usually helps the plant take up nutrients better. So mycorrhizae are commonly found in biostimulants. Um, I think that they would depend on the biofungicide. And so that's an important uh, question to ask. If you're using mycorrhizae, what will be the effect of the biofungicide on that mycorrhiza? Uh, and there are some different places that you can find that information. The label may have that information. Um, you can certainly reach out to your local extension agent, see what they know, um, and you can also contact the manufacturer or the person who's selling either the mycorrhizae or the biofungicide and ask them about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about compatibility in a few slides. I really appreciate all these questions. Crystal, did I do okay with your question? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, and we took some time for questions. I appreciate those who have asked. So let's move on to talking about how do you use biological fungicides effectively? Because if you are thinking about spending money on a biofungicide, obviously you want to know that it's going to give you some benefit. An important first thing to mention is that biofungicides work best when they're used as part of an integrated pest management strategy. And so generally speaking, the steps for IPM are to prepare ahead of time so that you know what pests you might be facing and you have an idea of what strategies or options for dealing with those pests. Number two, take some steps to prevent pest problems in the first place. Um, whether that is excluding pests or creating an environment that isn't good for pests. And by pests here, I mean both insect pests and plant disease pests. Number three, you would want to be scouting for pests and identifying them correctly to know if they are a problem. And then choosing a strategy and using it. And your choice of strategy depends on a lot of things, what you know about if it's effective, what types of products you're interested in using, what the cost is, what the risks are. And this is the step where you might incorporate a biofungicide because a biofungicide would be one of your options for controlling pests. And then it's really important to assess how your strategy worked. Make some notes about whether or not the biofungicide was effective. Uh, biofungicides are not 
in and of themselves meant to be the only solution to a pest problem. But if you integrate them into an integrated pest management program, you're more likely to have success with them. And partly this is due to the fact that they tend to work better um, when you use them earlier, which is my next slide. So if you're using biofungicides, you're much more likely to have success if you start early. They generally work best when they are used with relatively low disease pressure. And this might even be a little bit heavy on the powdery mildew. I might wanna start even a little earlier than this to use a biofungicide, but certainly by the time the powdery mildew covers your pumpkin leaf, a biofungicide is very unlikely to be helpful. I also suggest that you have answers to a variety of questions about a biofungicide that you're considering using. So you can get these answers from extension agents, um, but also I think if someone's trying to sell you a biofungicide, they should know how it works, for example. And if they can't tell you how it works, you might wonder um, if they are the best source of information for whether the product will work. So as we talked about with these different modes of action, if a biofungicide has to be growing on the leaves of the plant before the pathogen arrives, then that impacts when you apply it. And that's different from the pathogen is already there in low numbers and you're going to poison it with the biofungicide. So these modes of action are important because they can give you information about when is the best time to use the biofungicide to maximize its effectiveness. It's also good to ask if the biofungicide is currently alive, is supposed to be alive, the active ingredient in it, and if it needs to stay alive. So on those modes of action slide, I pointed out some situations where the biofungicide is definitely alive, like it has to grow on the leaf, and some situations where it may or may not be. So um, if the biofungicide contains products from a microorganism that were produced while the microbe was being grown, and that's what's poisoning the plant, then it doesn't, you don't have a living microbe that has to stay alive while you make your biofungicide application or while you're storing your biofungicide. Uh, and so knowing whether the biofungicide contains something living that has to stay living will help you know how long to store it and how to store it and how to use it. So it's good to ask if there are special instructions for storing a biofungicide and using it. Are there um, limitations to the temperature at which you should store it? Should the pH of the water when you're mixing it up be within a certain range, especially if it's a living organism, that range might be narrower. And is there a particular time of day that you might want to focus on applying that biofungicide? And this can be especially important if it's a living microbe that has to stay alive to be effective. It's also good to ask about the compatibility of the biofungicide with other things that you're using. And so this is related to the question about mycorrhizae. Um, and the, the compatibility can go two ways, right? You don't want to use the biofungicide and then use another um, pesticide that's going to kill the biofungicide if you have a living microbe. Um, but you also don't want the biofungicide to harm, for example, mycorrhizae or something else in the system. So it's important to understand which other um, production um, strategies or uh, other products, whether they're fertilizers or pesticides, are compatible with the biofungicide you're thinking about using. Um, different manufacturers provide different levels of information about this. Sometimes there's information right on the pesticide label uh, some companies provide some nice fact sheets about that, um, but it's a good thing to do your homework on and look up ahead of time. It's also important to know where you can learn more information. Um, so as I have mentioned a few times, your local extension experts are great people to go to, whether that's Crystal or Ethan or Teresa or others. There are some online resources from Cornell related to choosing biofungicides for vegetable production. 
and whether those biofungicides work. Unfortunately, right now, all of these resources are in English. That's definitely something where we could make some improvements. Um, and I sent links to these resources to Crystal and Ethan. And so my understanding is that they can distribute those links to you um, so that you can have them. Otherwise, I could also put them in the chat. You actually have them handy because I completely forgot to pull them up. If you don't, I will pull them up and it'll be one minute. Nope, I have them handy. Ah, you're the best. It's very full service. <laughs> I try. <laughs> All right, um, so there are some organic guides for vegetables. Um, and these are focusing on organic strategies for managing pests and vegetables. I don't think that all of the vegetables are covered, but a lot of them are. Um, so these would not include biofungicides that are not approved for organic production, but most of the biofungicides um, are approved for organic production. And these guides do have notes um, about what we know about the effectiveness of these biofungicides. Sometimes we don't have great answers. Sometimes there's question marks. On the same link, you can also find more information about organic product efficacy trials from Cornell, um, specifically some that were conducted in upstate New York. And by that, I mean everything outside of New York City, um, well, north and west of New York City. There are also uh, efficacy trials that were done on Long Island. And I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, and so this is another place to find some information about which biopesticides, which biofungicides work. And then Cornell also has a page devoted to resources for organic vegetables. It's certainly not exclusively biofungicides, um, but it would include some information there and also other links that are relevant for organic production of vegetables. There is one blog I found from the University of Maryland that is all in Spanish. It's certainly not exclusively about biofungicides or even pest control, but it may be a useful resource that you might want to take a look at. I also shared with Crystal and Ethan a few notes. So I looked through the Cornell resources and tried to make some notes about some biofungicides where there was decent evidence that they were effective for a few plant diseases. It is certainly not an exhaustive list. I think that they can share that list with you that I put together. Um, but I also wanted to say, if you have questions about the efficacy of a specific product, I certainly may not know off the top of my head um, but you are welcome to ask me. If you put your question in the chat and I don't know the answer, I can um, look for it and I can get that information back to Crystal and Ethan. Um, I'll also put my email address in the chat um, and you are welcome to email me and ask me if you have specific uh, FXC questions. Again, I may not always know the answer off the top of my head, but I'm happy to look it up for you. Um, and you're welcome to email me in whichever language feels most comfortable to you. I um, have coworkers who can help me with translation back and forth, if that's something that's useful. All right, any final questions. And again, you're welcome to put those questions in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask those questions, and the language justice team is available to interpret them and my response. And while people are coming up with their questions, I do just want to point out that um, Mar Amara has also been doing a lot of work to evaluate organic pesticides and biofungicides um, and just got a second grant to do trial work with this. So it's, it's an ongoing piece of work, which Amara has been really invaluable in making sure we, we have information on in New York. And what Crystal modestly did not mention is that she has also been 
helping with both the first grant and the second grant, um, and we'll be doing a lot of those trials as well. Yes. All right. You, you have questions coming in. If you want, I can I can read through them, and then um, Ethan doesn't have to do quite as much legwork on translation. <laughs> they'll be they'll be uh, out loud then. Um, so, so you had a question about whether Bordeaux mixture is considered to be a biofungicide, and I guess we should start with what a Bordeaux mixture is and go from there. Yes, well, thank you, because that was going to be my first question. Um, I had forgotten what Bordeaux mixture is, and the answer is that it's a sulfur-based powder. Um, I would have to look up and see if sulfur is considered a biofungicide by the Environmental Protection Agency. It could also be that some formulations of sulfur are, but others aren't. Um, just like in organic production, some formulations of sulfur might be approved for organic production, but some might not. So I don't know off the top of my head, I'd have to um, look that up. Although there, I could probably do that pretty quickly um, if there are not additional questions. Or while there, we're there are, there okay. are. Um, so you, you also had a question about um, using Bacillus thuringiensis to treat, oops, I just lost it, stored um, bee frames for wax moths. It's a little bit off of vegetable production. So if we need to take that one offline, that's okay too. Yeah, I think my first, so I don't know anything off the top of my head about this. Um, my first, the first really important thing would be to determine whether whatever formulation of Bacillus thuringiensis you were thinking about using, um, that would be a, it's a biopesticide. So it needs to have wax moth on the label and it needs to have on the label also that it can be used to treat um, stored uh, frames from beehives. Um, if it doesn't have those things in the label, then that's not a legal use of that product. So in New York State, the, if you're using a pesticide, including a biopesticide, it has to include the pest and the location um, on the label for it to be a legal application. So that would be the first thing to know is if it's allowed to be used in that way. Um, I will say also that there are different um, types of Bacillus thuringiensis. So some of them work on moth or butterfly larvae and some of them don't at all. Some of them only work on, um, on flies. So um, it would certainly be important to check the label of the product you are considering using, see if that's allowed. Um, as far as whether or not it would be effective, I don't know, but I can try to find out. That's fair. And while you're doing that, I want to just quickly, um, before everybody starts leaving, just launch the poll questions that we have. It's just two questions, and we use this information to make sure that the classes that we're giving are giving you information that you need and they also help guide our future programming. So please, please do the poll questions and then I'll turn it back to you, Amara. So I, um, I did look up sulfur and it doesn't look like there is a sulfur formulation that is considered a biofungicide. Doesn't mean it might not be effective or might not be something you could use on your farm. Um, but probably Bordeaux mixture would not be considered a biofungicide. Yeah, my understanding of Bordeaux mixtures going way back is that they're more of a dormant fruit tree spray. So they're really used um, prior to the plant having any leaves at all and that they're pretty harsh in the scheme of organic controls. Thanks, Crystal. That's a really important comment, really important note. Well, did you have any last comments before I thank you and allow folks to move on with their day today, Amara? I think my only comments were, again, to say thank you um, to Crystal and Ethan, to our interpreters and translators, the language justice team, 
really appreciate your support in making this possible. Um, I do have some contact information on this slide. Uh, if any of you like to follow me on social media, um, I do have a blog that I post on periodically, and that includes information about all types of biological control, including biofungicides. But yeah, thank you and have a great day. Thanks so much, Amara. And I do encourage everyone to check out the blog. It's a lot of fun.